we do forms of this all the time. A lot of the times, if he's on the departure side, I'm not even going to give a clearance. I just am going to withhold it in anticipation of this scenario because it happens to us a lot because of mm-hmm. all of the fields that we work. The only thing I can think in this, they can't withhold the clearance too long or they're either going to have to keep the plane really high, you know, because it may go into a portion of non-radar mm-hmm. where they have to give the clearance for the aircraft to descend. Ready. This is Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk. Your host, Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf, have a combined 40 years of aviation experience as pilots and air traffic controllers. They answer your questions and share their opinions about flying and air traffic control. This show is not official guidance and should not be used as a replacement for your instructor, your pilot examiner, the endless books of regulations, your favorite comedian, your neighbor, your spouse, or your cat. November 628 Charlie Delta Squawk 1200, frequency change approved. The audio will be available on live ATC. Good day. November 643 Juliet Mike, third visual approach, one way, two, three left, connect hour. November 3222 Yankee, area of heavy to extreme precipitation, 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, 15 miles, 7 Radiant miles. Uh, 3047 Charlie, try a departure, let our contact, climb and maintain. November 747 Sierra Lima, reduce speed to 180, you're overtaking traffic ahead on fun. Skyhawk 77 Tango, IFR cancellation received. Squawk 3 apply. Frequency change approved. Sierra 720 yeah. Fox, Tron Alpha, flatting 190 vectors for the visual approach. Skyhawk Runway 23 left. To enter triad class Charlie surface area from the east. Maintain special. Charlie Fox, Fox Golf Fox, Tron Alpha. This is triad approach on guard. You are being intercepted. The border is still closed. Say intentions. Please welcome your favorite controllers, Alpha Golf and Romeo Hotel. Monday, June 7th, 2021, episode 180. On today's show, we'll talk about blocked airspace at non-towered airports, a tower closing on the final approach, and descent planning. What's up, AJ? Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Monday. Indeed. Welcome back from vacation. Thank you. Tell us about that. Yes, we... Um, I... I I use the word borrowed hesitantly because it, it was really more thrust upon us <laughs> <laughs> for a long time. Our friends have been uh, begging us to take their RV uh, to the beach or wherever we wanted, really. But mm-hmm. uh, take it, take it, please. Go, go on a long weekend. Go for a week. Go for wherever. We don't care. Just take it. I suspect so that they could have it washed. (laughs) 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 I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. Uh, But anyway, so finally we did. It's a is a 32 foot Class C. Um, First time I'd ever driven anything. Well, I mean, other than you know, a U-Haul from Mm -hmm. somewhere to somewhere in town. So anyway, it was quite an experience. The kids loved it. They thought it was great. You know, that you're driving the house around. Um, <laughs> stopping for lunch is very easy. You just find somewhere to pull off and, uh, you know, make a sandwich. <laughs> it's all just right there. It's amazing. You yeah. didn't try to pull through a drive through with that big machine, did you? Uh, no. No, I I stuck to very major roads. <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing crazy. I kind of ripped the top of the RV off, yeah. Uh, But yeah, so we went to the beach. It was fun. Uh, They had a bunch of stuff at this campground. It's a huge campground. There's like 800 and some Mm. sites. Yeah. So anyway, that was was fun. Cool. You went flying? No, I wrote that in there thinking I might go flying this weekend. That did not happen, but it is going to happen next weekend. Oh, okay. I am flying. This is a good time to say for those, well... I don't know if this is a public event or not. Maybe I shouldn't say. I will be at a nearby airport for a flying club discussion with their flying club next weekend. Hmm. Nearby. Nearby. I hesit- 
hate to say where because I don't think it's a public event. It's just for the club. Oh, I see. So, okay. Yeah. But that is when I'm going to be flying. I don't have any other good stories. Mm. I don't think from this week. No. Okay. I don't. Not that I can really remember. Mm. It was a weird week. A double mid week again. Uh, mm. uh, yuck. Yeah, yucky. Shall we begin? Let us begin. Ready. Since OB-179, we have two new patrons. Romeo Foxtrot is new in the show listener tier, and Papa Tango, who I believe is in the chat room, is in the new, is in the show supporter tier. Welcome to Patreon. The best air traffic and flying podcast heard on all seven continents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you'd like to learn more about supporting the show, check out patreon.com slash opposing basis. And if you haven't done so already, leave us a review and a five-star rating. And there's a button in your podcast player to make sure our shows are ready each week. Hit subscribe or follow. So they're sitting there after they are produced. And if you can, share the show with one of your friends. Thank you, everybody, and welcome to Patreon. Ah. Reviews and announcements. <laughs> Reviews and announcements. Uh, we have a review and three pseudo announcements. Right. What do you want? Uh, oh, I'm going to do a share screen. You do number one. I'll, I'll get this screen to come up oh. so the chat room can see. Oops. I put the wrong banner on. There we go. I have to find a new banner person. Uh, not, oh. Oh. <laughs> I can't see it. Okay. It sort of looks like the Millennium Falcon, Falcon, Falcon. Yeah, or some sort of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, uh. All right, new patron, Juliet Bravo sent us pictures of the airport design contest from 1928. The unofficial winner on our Patreon survey was Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Which is what I named that one. <laughs> okay, so that one's Wheel of Fortune. And Penthouse oh, Circle well, of we've... Death. That sounds oh. lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Close second place. <laughs> Let me pull that one up. Hold on. It is the penthouse circle of death. Yes. It's okay. So it's got high rises, maybe seven or eight high. Well, no, more than that. Probably oh, yeah. 20 high rises that are holding 20. this eight point circle up in the air, maybe 30 or 40 floors up. Wagon wheel, if you will. Yep. Ha. Oh, yep. <laughs> 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 yes, and it looks like if you were to circumnavigate this airport and made a mistake, you would plummet <laughs> to the earth. Yeah, don't land short and and don't go off the end. Although it's high <laughs> enough that you might have time to get the airplane flying again. Uh, True. Maybe True. that could be an advantage. Mm-hmm. Just don't land short. That's all I can say. I mean, this was... Their attempt at humor back then, I guess, but maybe they actually <laughs> thought this could happen. <laughs> Thank you, Julia mm. Bravo, for sharing well, those. Uh, could possibly go wrong. Was that? Was could possibly go wrong? Yeah. yeah. All right, we got a new review from APCF25. Try it approach. You make a good podcast. Alpha Charlie, five stars. Awesome. No content. That was just the title, but it, hey, that's all you need to say. Thank you, sir. Hey, yeah. ma'am. Love it. Short and sweet. Mm-hmm. That's two in a row like that. Uh, the number ones. Da 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 da. Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Is it Qatar or Cutter? Cutter. I've heard it both ways. Okay. I don't know. Obviously, there's someone listening there. At least one mm. person. Tell us how to say it properly. Yes, please. In English. Yes. All right, and our last announcement, uh, the controller with atrocious settings called me after listening to the beginning of last week's show when they heard the audio from Joe the Airbus guy about radar contact about 200 miles from the land, mm-hmm. give or take, over the ocean on the way up from San Juan to Boston, was it? Somewhere up there. Boston. Anyway, they were in radar contact really far out from land and control with the atrocious settings thinks that it could be similar equipment to what he had when he was in the top secret island area out west and they had an asr 11 which we've heard that term before but that's normally up to 60 miles maybe this one had some fancy add-on who knows but yeah aftermarket stuff 
Yeah, so he, he has seen 200 miles before. They had to use center rules because it was too far from the antenna, but mm-hmm. anyway, that, mm. that could have been it. Some special bar, Bermuda. Is it Bermuda? Yeah, it was Bermuda out there is what he was talking about. Some special Bermuda radar. <laughs> Bermuda. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's it for All announcements. Right. That puts that to rest. Hmm? Timely feedback. Timely feedback. You were saying something when I hit the noise. And I, I, I said it. that puts that to rest. Mm, yeah. The top secret <laughs> Bermuda radar. That's the yeah, end yeah. of that debate. Yeah, yeah. We got it. We got All to right, the bottom of it. Three audios and a fourth one with a story. Which one would you like? Odds mm. or evens? <laughs> <laughs> I'll read the thing. Go ahead. All okay. right. So I get number one. From Patreon, November Mike, send in audio. Hey, AGNRH. This is Patreon November Mike from Under the Rainy Coffee Bravo. I just listened to the most recent episode and uh, caught the comment about sending your flight plans to your mom. I just thought that was sort of funny because I do sometimes send my flight plans to my mom. Uh, usually not to, you know, have her check them out, but mostly because we get to fly together sometimes. She's super cool. She's a listener of Opposing Bases. Her initials are Alpha Golf. So she shares that with you. Nice. And uh, she has her commercial and CFI in the States, as well as her frozen ATPL, I believe, in New Zealand, which is pretty unique. Mm. But we, we've been able to fly together recently. She uh, is living in Oregon at the moment. So she comes up here, or I go down there, and we've been flying together on the G1000. I recently got my instrument rating, so we've been just doing some IFR stuff together, and it's been super fun. She's a listener. I figured I'd give her a shout out. Thanks. Shout out to Mom Alpha Golf, not to be confused with Papa Golf. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who's the mom of Alpha Golf? <laughs> Who is it nearby? Can you make eye contact with her at this point? <laughs> if I was Superman. <laughs> uh, thank you, November Mike, for sending that in. Uh, we talked about a couple shows ago about sending your flight plans to your parents so they know where you're at. That's a nice little twist on that story. I like it. Mm-hmm. What, number two? Number two. From patron Juliet Mike. Hey, guys. I loved OB-178 and the whole radar contact um, discussion. I have one question, though. Um, I fly on the Rocky Mountain State Western Slope um, area, and I had an instrument student I was doing uh instrument approaches with and we were on a ifr flight plan and we were on the published mist and uh denver center gave us a uh, traffic advisory uh, a plane he was not talking to and we were we were converging and he gave me an alert and um i looked out the window could not see him um i saw him on adsb and uh and then he came back on Converging, possible convergence, you know, whatever, you know, half mile now or what? No, it wasn't half mile. I think it was like one mile or something. Um, same altitude. And so I just turned. I just told the student, I forget which way we turned, right or left, I forget. So I just immediately turned. And then it passed, they passed off on my uh, right hand side. And I was a little bit confused because I th- thought that Denver Center would give me a heading to fly. But he treated me like I was VFR. Now I was in in VMC conditions, but on IFR flight plan. Um, so, anyways, I was curious to know why that would have happened like that, um, since I thought it was his main responsibility. The contract that you talk about between me and the controller to keep me from hitting something. So, anyway, love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you much for the show. I really enjoyed it. This show was super funny. I loved it. Go ahead. I'll let you go first on that. All right. Just so I have this right. Talking to the center, IFR, and this is just some rando airplane. Yep. He's on the published miss talking to ATC. The <clears throat> rando is not. You Level? He's not in the climb on the mist. I just want to make sure I didn't miss something here. He's he didn't say if he was level or not. He was on published miss is how I think he described it. So Okay. It just depends on... If he's below the MVA, 
He's not going to get a turn, right? I mean, he can. For emergency purposes? A missed approach is one of the ones where we could give a turn. Just like a departure. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I guess it just depends on the terrain and everything. Uh, maybe that... I'm just trying to get in this in the controller's head. Like, why Why would I not want to turn the guy? But you're right. Typ- I, I mean, Juliet, Mike, you're right. That typically, if there's some kind of conflict and it looks like it could potentially be a problem, yeah, we're just going to turn the guy. Um, <clears throat> IFR... Or VFR, it doesn't matter. Even VFRs, we turn all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I assume if you're getting flight following that, and you want traffic advisories, that you would also, you know, want to turn away from traffic if that becomes necessary. So it's not uncommon at all to have a VFR that's just flying through, getting flight following, and, and say, turn 20 degrees right for traffic. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure why. So I'll add this. It's possible this was happening. The the airplanes that we're not talking to, I guess this is a good point to advertise for flight falling. Even if the other airplane was just tooling around in the practice area or something. If you're near an airport and you're not talking to us and we are talking to airplanes that are relying on us to keep them from hitting things and other airplanes, it's difficult sometimes, especially if you don't have a trend vector up for that non-radar identified airplane, to figure out which way to go with somebody because you would think this doesn't happen with current technology in ADS-B, but it's almost as, as if some planes are trying to hit our traffic. If we go one way, they go that way and almost converge with them. It so happens all the time. If that controller were zoomed out and it's hard to get a read on which direction that, or it's the first time that airplane popped up and they don't have any trend information on which direction it's going, it's technically impossible for us to turn you in a direction that will guarantee we can try. And when you say you were treated like you were VFR, he may have used words like suggest or advise something to that effect because the controller does not know what direction that other airplane is going. So that's a good point. Yeah. We, I don't know how to say this without really get into the legal wranglings. If they were to hit, someone could try, I'm not saying they would succeed. Someone could try to make the argument that the controller contributed to that if the turn put them in that collision. I'm not saying that that would be one argument, but they could try to make that argument that if you had just turned them the other way, they wouldn't have hit. Well, yeah, that's true. (laughs) But I didn't know which direction the other airplane was going to go. Right. So not everybody has TCAS. Not everybody has ADS-B. It depends on what type of airspace this was in. Not everybody has radios still. In 2021, we still have airplanes with no radios. Um, so yeah, we are under contract with you to try to keep you away, but an airplane we're not talking to, it's not always possible to do that. So climbs and descents are a better way to defend against that. If we can rely even a little bit on that altitude readout, if they did have a transponder, but again, you're getting into the weeds on if he's not identified, we really don't know what that plane is going to do. Yeah. Yeah. There's even, I think there's a blurb or at least there used to be about, Altitude assignments, you know, for un for unverified merging targets, I guess, mm-hmm. um, because you could you could assign an altitude and just like a turn, that guy could start climbing, you know, or start descending depending on what you did. It just seems like they always are trying to do, you know, what you're trying to do to get away from them, and they just. Mm-hmm reverse everything i don't know it it is kind of frustrating sometimes which puts the controller down the tubes in a second if there's anything else going on in his airspace they're not a lot they're not paying attention to that because that becomes their focus right it is extremely frustrating and on some days i'm known to do this after those air those targets are pulled apart and i got lucky i'll try to see if i can identify who what airplane that is and reach out in the blind i'll push the magic button or i can see their call sign and reach out Hey, airplane that thinks they're not in the way, please call me. You right. are in the way. Yeah, <laughs> you're exactly. almost you were you were almost hit just now. So, all right, I won't get on that soapbox. I'll leave it alone. All right, I have another one. Number three from Patreon, Julie Echo Foxtrot. More audio. 
Hello, AG and RH. This is Juliet Echo Foxtrot with some feedback to episode 178. I was also doing some solo cross country work and overflew a Delta airspace. And I called the controller and told him I was overflying his airspace, probably by about 500 feet. And he gave me the altimeter setting and I continued on my way. And my question is um, what needs to be done? after that do i just continue on my way do i need to tell him when i'm well past his airspace or is that the end of the conversation uh, i was curious about what might needed to have done i uh continued flying and didn't say anything else to him uh if you could let me know that'd be great thank you mm. so that controller likely did not radar identify you there's really no requisite hello or goodbye you did the right thing i think in my opinion by calling them now if there's no surrounding there's if, if there's no surrounding tracon for charlie or bravo airport it's not a bad idea if there's a center frequency where you get flight following letting them know would be just as appropriate mm -hmm. uh they're the ones who control the releases of ifrs off that airport and maybe can worry about altitude separation with jets coming off or props for that matter so you know, don't be afraid. If you're gonna if you're gonna take the time to reach out to the Delta controller, don't be afraid to try to find somebody to actually get radar services from. And you don't have to worry about hellos and goodbyes. They'll handle that. Yeah. In this mm -hmm. case, I would say, um, <clears throat> obviously, it's not required, but report clear or just say, hey, we're clear to the southwest frequency change, just so the guy knows you're not, you know, expecting yeah. some other thing or I don't know. He just might let be him know you're slow, leaving the frequency, I would say. A slow tower. He's happy to talk to you, and you just flew away and didn't even say goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, chat him up a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. no. yeah. All right, you want to get the last one? Number four. From SCAC patron Sierra Echo. F-W-I-W. For what know. it's worth. What does that mean? For what it's worth. Oh, well, I never would have known that. <laughs> Some years ago, <laughs> I do received the same letter from a certain Class C A's airport on the other side of the bay from the West Coast Bay Bravo. Oh, uh, they are talking about the noise abatement. Uh, nasty yes. gram they got. Okay. Right, right. And it was exactly the same circumstances. The, uh, that airport has two separate runway complexes, several runways on the north side for GA and the one big runway sitting in the bay for commercial traffic. I was at an FBO on the north side and tower offered a departure in a jet from the GA runways on the north side of the airport. I accepted and got the letter. I think the heart of that issue was that the noise abatement rules uh, were county or airport rules that were only visible on the airport website, not the FAA rules. Since then, it seems the rules have been harmonized. The noise abatement rules have now actually become recommendations and requests and perhaps not deserving of nasty letters if violated and are referenced in FAA documents. And I now depart from the runway in the bay to do my part. Regards, SCAC, Sierra Echo. Mm, okay, so, yeah. Noise abatement rules are sort of a, <laughs> are sometimes rules and sometimes recommendations or suggestions or, <laughs> you know, threats. Really strong requests. <laughs> yeah. Strongly worded, empty threats mm -hmm. from angry residences. Is? So, I don't know. I don't but know. good for you for doing your part. And if the jets are going off that big commercial runway and you have to tax a little bit longer, that's you're being a good neighbor and playing your part in the whole thing. So, Right. It sounds to me like, in some cases, the controller's... Just don't care. <laughs> That's your problem. I don't it, care it, about that. Yeah. That could be the case at a bigger airport too, where maybe they're not as involved and you know don't don't hear from the people that are involved in those conversations. Right. I can tell you this: we've had different approaches to it at this airport over the years, and it depends on who's in charge on the on the air traffic side, on how willing they are to listen and implement suggestions. And, and work with the surrounding area. Sometimes our, the, their hand is forced, um, but some of the requests may get to, and I'm not saying that's happened here, but 
Some of the requests are ridiculous. We can't make every airplane just not depart after a certain hour. This airport is very busy with cargo traffic at night. There's going to be noise. So it's finding that middle ground to appease everyone, which is impossible, but at least attempt to. Right. So, but all right. Thank you for sending that in. Before we go into the show topic, we did get word in the chat room that the event is public. We can say where we're going. It'll be at the Tango Tango Alpha Airport near Duke on Saturday for a flying club talk. I will be there at one. AG is not able to attend. You have a previous engagement. I do. But I will be bringing another controller who's also a show listener and patron, Charlie Victor. So, oh, nice. One o'clock Saturday at TTA near Duke. That's all the details I have at this point. I'm going to land and hopefully that's obvious which direction I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Mm-hmm. All right, this week's show topic is brought to us by Romeo Whiskey. Sent in a couple of questions recently, and I thought this one was worth having a discussion about. Hello, AG and RH. Hoping you could shed some light on a situation that happened yesterday. It was with a center, so I'm not sure if the rules are the same. No, let's stop there. They're not the same. They don't have really any rules like we do. They're, they're bound by all these crazy parameters that they can't possibly do as awesome of a job as we can. Right, there, I got to say it. Yeah. Which is why you should, at any cost, avoid talking to them. (laughs) (laughs) All right, he continues. I was on the ground at a rural, non-towered field. Engines running at the whole short line and called center on the phone list number listed to get my clearance and release. He quickly asked if I was ready to go right away. And I said, yes. Then he said, hold on. (laughs) I might be number two or maybe number three. I could tell there was nobody else on the ground waiting clearance. So I held on the line for about 10 minutes. I then hung up and called back, assuming I got disconnected. When center answered again, they told me to call back in another 10 or 15 minutes. They have some inbound traffic. Fortunately, the clouds were breaking up, and I was able to depart VFR and get my clearance in the air. All right, I'll pause right there, too. We've been asked this several times. Is it better to get your clearance on the ground or in the air? This would be a good example if you feel like you can get a good flick of what's going on or not going on in the airspace on the CTAF, and you can depart VFR could save yourself countless minutes so all right but looking at the adsb traffic and listening to the radio once i was airborne i'm pretty sure i could tell what happened there was an aircraft inbound on an instrument approach however when i called for my clearance the aircraft was still on the departure side of the airport headed directly to the initial approach fix to fly a hold in lieu of procedure turn to turn around and fly the procedure this is something like at least 35 flying miles when i first called The aircraft showed a ground speed of less than 90 knots. So we're talking about 20 minutes that that airport was shut down for IFR traffic. I had a similar scenario happen about a month ago. I understand that once an aircraft is cleared for the approach that nobody else can be cleared to arrive or depart that airport. But is it possible for air traffic to unclear an aircraft for an approach? Could the controller have said to the inbound aircraft, approach clearance canceled, continue on the approach. I just need to get a departure off expect approach clearance in five minutes or something like that with over 20 minutes to go i wouldn't have even been remotely close to a squeeze play is this a possibility that the controller didn't consider or perhaps was too busy to consider if this is a possibility is it something you have ever done to help expedite traffic at uncontrolled fields thanks romeo whiskey this is a good question i like this one great question were you in the room last week when we actually did this we uncleared somebody or was that somebody else? I don't remember that. Okay, so I'll, we'll bring it into a triad situation. We're not center. We do have 16 or so airports with IFR departures occasionally. This was a day where the clouds were too low. They had to get it on the ground. They were going to take off. It was like five or 600 foot ceiling. So poof, there's no way they're going to take off VFR and hope for the best. They're going to get their clearance on the ground. Well, we had already, this was over at uh, Southwest Barbecue. We had already coordinated with metroplex the airspace was blocked off the airplane was direct to the fix where they could do the hold and they were already cleared and it was a helicopter one of the ones that likes to depart ifr during the week and practice all the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so they were cleared for the approach already the airplane called me on the ground now i thought when i looked i i picked up the phone it was a pilot on the ground at southwest barbecue i'm ready to go i thought the airplane was already inside that fix 
because I just leaned over, kind of looked from where I was on the phone, right. and I said, it's going to be a minute. We have an inbound. As soon as you see him cross the threshold, call me, and we can work something out because he's doing a practice approach. As soon as we get some altitude, we can let you go. So the problem I'm building in my head is as soon as he gets to about 3,500 feet, I can let this other guy go to 3,000 because I don't care what runway you come off of. I can't dictate which one you depart. I can't assume that you're not going to turn or something before you get to me. And I have to block off altitude. That's what I'm getting at. We're blocking off altitude. So if I have another player in the game, I have to wait till he's high enough where your climb to a safe altitude is not going to bus separation. And this one on the ground was a jet and it was a helicopter. So they're going to be close to the field still. Well, he said, okay, I'll call back. Well, then I, I, I walked back over. I said, hey, this guy wants a release. The other guy was outbound at the hold. So we have the same scenario, Bill. It's going to take forever. I said, oh, man, now I feel bad. So I sat there and thought, well, there's no way. I can't, I can't call the guy. I don't have his number yeah. to, to tell him. And I kind of talked to the controller. He's like, I'll just hold this guy at four and let this guy go climb to three. I said, well, I can't talk to him. What am I supposed to yeah, do? He's gone. Just, yeah. No, we didn't give up. We had the helicopter at 4,000 call the CTAF and say, call approach again. They're going to let you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> so he called us. He took off to three and they merged at 3,000 and 4,000. Um, you know, and we did. We, uh, he, the, I, I didn't do it. I wasn't on the position, but the, the controller uncleared him, said, maintain 4,000, hold Southwest as published. As uh -huh. soon as we get this airplane by, we're going to let you out. And he was going to racetrack airport, so real close. He was on the ground at his destination before <laughs> the other airplane even canceled. His, actually got him done with his first approach. He was doing a miss still. So anyway, the answer, the, the, the long answer to your question is yes, we can unclear them. But we have communication issues with getting that other airplane back. Now, I find it hard to believe that they expected you to hold on the phone this whole time. We don't have a real good mechanism to do that. If we put the phone down, you're listening to a bunch of off mic chatter in the room. You yeah, could hear everything. Yeah, you don't want to be, you don't <laughs> even want to. No. <laughs> no, you don't want to hear that. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be hanging up. It's recorded. And yeah, only bad things are going to happen if that line is hot <laughs> in the, in the room. So, um, Anything to add to that? I, I wanted to share that story. That was another reason I wanted to do this one as a show topic. Yeah. So we we do forms of this all the time. A lot of the times, you know, if he's on the departure side, I'm not even going to give a clearance. Right. Yep. I just am going to withhold it in anticipation of this scenario because it happens to us a lot because of mm -hmm. all of the fields that we work. The only thing I can think in this center um situation is that uh they can't withhold the clearance too long or they're either going to have to keep the plane really high you know because it may go into a portion of non radar where mm -hmm. they have to give the clearance for the aircraft to descend mm -hmm. you know to start descending on the approach so that's that's maybe a possibility i don't know it doesn't sound like 4000 it's terribly high. I, don't, I just don't know. So maybe that's a possibility. Maybe it's not. Um, uh, but we use forms of this all the time. Uh, you know, and I've learned to reiterate, join the approach, maintain 4,000. You are not cleared for the approach. <laughs> Do not descend. Stay well, that's the part I want to pause on. That's what that means. But for us. I want you to laterally navigate. Yes. But don't start descending when you get to fixed A. Don't descend for fixed B's altitude. Don't do that. Right. Right. I wasn't clear once on that, and I got burned. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you descending? You said join the approach. You didn't say what you meant by that because right. you made up the phraseology. Sometimes we have to improvise. Right. I mean, in so, that case, not to, you know, uh, dig up a dead horse and beat it, but I did say <laughs> maintain 4,000, join the approach. <laughs> or it could have been join the approach and maintain 4,000. I don't know. Anyway, I I admitted that it was my fault, and I don't do that anymore. So, um, 
it is possible to unclear, cancel approach clearance. So we have an area of our airspace to the east with Cope Factory and Statue of Liberty area. There's conflicting missed approaches. So the big picture that I know we've talked about, but I'll reiterate it. We have to assume that every airplane is going to lose their radios. And we have to assume that every airplane is going to go missed. So not only is the approach path of the cleared approach protected, the missed approach area, which oftentimes goes right back to the departure side or the arrival side of the airport, aiming right at another airplane. And we have, we have no other protection than altitude and waiting. The other airplanes have to hold, they have to wait. Sometimes they'll figure out what's going on and the controllers can get involved and say, Hey, you're going to end up waiting forever here. Let's go here first. And we could do something that's, you know, a little bit outside the gray area of protect. How far do we protect this airspace is an, is a question that gets asked all the time. Right. Um, but Hey, I'm going to put you over at this airport first. Can you do that one? Yeah. Cause I can clear you now done. Or they'll say, Hey, we'll hold. We have to work on this. Let that departure go. Great. Awesome. That works. Yeah. But that happens. It's, that's not unique to triad airspace. That happens all over the place that airplanes right. are stuck near another airport that's popular and there's departures trying to get out. So in this case, you took off, you went VFR that worked. It saved you another 10 minutes of waiting. Uh, that might be a way the controllers at the center are forcing your hand. They're not willing to work with you. They're not giving you any help. And they're hoping that you'll do that. Just call me airborne. And maybe they're afraid to say it. I don't, I don't, I don't mind saying that it's going to be faster. If, if it's VFR, just, just take off. Call yeah. me in the air. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't see what the problem with that is. If, if it's some company policy that you can't do that, fine. Mm. Then you're stuck. <laughs> I, <laughs> I offered you an out. <laughs> the difference being when they depart in their VFR, I say radar contact, they're still VFR. I can make sure I have required separation before I clear them. And now that conflict that we thought would have happened or could have happened if you were both IFR aimed at the same place in space yep. won't happen because now I can talk to you and tell you which way to go. Exactly. Yeah. Good question, Romeo Whiskey. I think you have another one in today's show. Do we have any, did we answer all those questions in that? I think so. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm sure he'll let us know if we didn't. Yeah. Feedback time. Feedback. I feel like I got the last one. And you feel like that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fine. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> From Patreon <laughs> November Mike. <laughs> ah, November Mike. Hi, AG and RH. Please feel free to edit shorten this as you see fit. All right. Thanks so much and curious to hear what you think. November Mike. <laughs> 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 Great question. November Mike, really good question. I think yes, and then sometimes no. And uh, moving on, I think you have number two. <laughs> For the record, I did shorten this. This was a, I took out some details. I changed the airport to home because I lacked creativity when I did this the other day. Uh -huh. um, so go ahead. Okay. Patreon. You're not getting off that easy. Patreon. <laughs> November Mike. Uh, foiled. My attempt foiled. Uh, patron November Mike from the Rainy Coffee Bravo. On a recent flight, I went like, oh, it went <laughs> like normal. <laughs> Until the very end where I was cleared for the RNAV 3-4 into home and told to contact tower. The local time was 8.03, approximately. Mm. And I knew that that home tower closes at 8. Oh, Okay. So I was a bit confused, but I switched over and called home tower. November 4, Quebec Papa, and got back towers closed from someone in the pattern. Okay, that's what I expected. I self-announced, completed the approach, and landed without issue. When I got on the ground, though, I had a realization. I didn't cancel my flight plan with coffee approach because they just handed me over to tower. But I didn't talk to tower because the tower was empty. So was my flight plan closed? I tried contacting Coffee Approach and then flight service via radio on the ground to no avail uh, because mm. it's in a small valley. So I ended up calling the Coffee Clearance Delivery phone number. I told 
the flight data guy, hey, I'm on the ground at home. And this seemed to confuse him. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> what approach were you on? Why are you calling me? <laughs> I overheard him chat with two other people in the approach facility, and then he told me that nobody was waiting to hear from me, but that he had written down that I was safely on the ground in case anyone came looking. So mm. my question, who closed my flight plan? Did the controller realize his mistake and close it after I switched to tower? Was it somehow automatically closed even though the tower wasn't operational? What was supposed to occur in this case and what should I do in the future? In retrospect, I could have contacted approach on COM2 to let them know the situation when I realized the tower was closed, but I didn't think about it until I was on the ground. Thanks so much. I'm curious to hear what you think, November Mike. Okay. Um, who closed my flight plan? No one. No one closed your flight plan because really no one does that. If you're IFR, IFR. It, it's just nothing physically happens. There's no typing sequence. There's no, there's nothing. It's just this thing that exists in people's heads. And I don't mean that, <laughs> I don't mean that uh, facetiously. I just, this idea of canceling isn't a, it's not a keystroke. It's not a signature. It's nothing that actually happens. It's th it's a thing that's out there in space that controllers are keeping track of. Okay, so did the controller realize his mistake and close it after I switched to tower? Here's my guess. He didn't realize the tower was closed. He's working approach. He's doing a lot of stuff. He doesn't know what time it is. He looks at the Zulu clock. That's all that's in there. He, You know, it's math, especially way out on the West Coast. <laughs> it's like 14 hours from Zulu. Who can do math like that? I mean, nobody can. So he doesn't care. He doesn't care what local time it is. It's dark. He's in a windowless room. He doesn't realize that it's 8 o'clock and that the tower is closed. Now, typically, our tower, the D airport in our airspace, calls us and says, hey, we're closing. Mm -hmm. But that's partially because we listen to their frequency. And we can hear the CTAF. We can hear people on the ground on the tower frequency mm -hmm. from the Tracon. That is probably not the case at this airport. So maybe they don't go through the process that we go through of, of sort of doing a handoff um, when the tower closes. So I can see in, in the three minutes after they close that it is very, very conceivable that the controller just didn't realize what time it was and switched you to a closed tower. So at this point, it reverts to uncontrolled field rules where you are responsible for relaying your cancellation to approach, which you did, which was the correct thing to do. However, them thinking that the tower was not closed, didn't understand what in the world you were talking about. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the, the last link in the closure, if you will, would be that the human being in the tower that's now not, he's no longer there because, okay, so let's differentiate at a non-towered airport you are responsible for canceling your IFR. That's usually through flight service or the phone number back to the approach. Some of them have remote frequencies. But if there's somebody working a tower, as soon as your wheels touch down, no one cares what, well, as soon as you get to the ramp and off the movement area, you're out of our area of concern. We know you're not flying anymore. You're, you're not lost. You're not Nordo out in the middle of Kansas. You're safe. The flight's over. That is the closure of your flight plan. So right. that, that, that person in the tower was no longer there, and that was the missing portion. So good for you for remembering that. In this case, it wouldn't have mattered if you'd forgotten because this was bad. This was a – if something had happened to you on that approach, no one would know. That's that's the worst part about this. You, right. were, in lo you were in no man's land. Uh, yeah. Assuming that you were still being looked after by air traffic because that controller thought the tower was still open. Now there's no one there and short final, bam, you go into the dirt and you're just, you need help. No one's going to be looking for you. You got a broken leg. Yeah. yeah. There's no overdue airplane because you're done. They thought you were done. Yeah. It's actually a very bad scenario in yeah. terms of what could have gone wrong. Right. Hopefully in this scenario, the guy, the other guy on CTAF who was, who's so, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> rudely said. <laughs> Tower's closed. <laughs> Hopefully that guy realizes, you know, what's happened. But you never know. So really think about IFR cancellation as uh, the onus is on the person responsible for ensuring that you landed safely. Okay? Yes. If there's a tower controller, it's on him. If there's not, it's on you. Mm-hmm. So cancellation then relies on you. Um, but yeah, I think one of the big takeaways here is your flight plan, your can, your IFR cancellation is not a thing that happens. I mean, it's it's not an event that takes place. Uh, I don't know. It's sort of a weird thing to try to describe, but. It is one. There's one final closing moment at a non-towered airport. Your strip should be sitting there. We should have some way to note that you're still, we're still waiting for you to cancel. And we do write letters on there. There's strip marks. That's a good it. point. Yeah, right. So at but places they, that still have strips, right? But at this ta- at this center approach, they put your strip, assuming they used it, into a, somewhere and it's stored. But that signifies, as soon as you, I've said this before, mm-hmm. you picking up that strip and taking it away from your area, and they could have changed controllers. It could be a new crew coming in. Who knows? You're yeah. gone. No one cares what happens to you anymore. You're gone. Yeah. You're in that bucket. You're in this little tin in our room. Yeah, if you're, you're in the out bucket, of you're just... my responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So. Mm. All right. Good question. I'll get number two from Mike Lima. Gentlemen, I'm doing some training at a local class Delta facility. Tower was changing the activities from a southbound runway to a northbound runway. Just as I was announcing my intention to land, I was given clearance to land north and told to report midfield on the downwind, which I did. At the same time, a training flight was approaching from the north to shoot an approach to the southbound runway and then go missed. Tower instructed me to perform two left 360s for spacing. I didn't argue with them, but I wasn't. Oh, there's parallel runways involved in this, too. They were on the other surface, if that makes sense. I just didn't want to read a bunch of numbers and get confused. I didn't argue with them, but I wasn't crazy about such maneuvering slow and at pattern altitude of 1,200 feet. As I was completing 360 number one, I could see the other plane departing the parallel runway. 90 degrees into my second left turn, Tower gave me the option of a right turn to enter the right base for the north runway. And I accomplished it in an uneventful landing. No harm, no foul, and Tower thanked me as I rolled out. But I was wondering why Tower felt like we needed that much spacing. The runways are parallel, but really not that close. Visibility was 10 miles with unlimited ceiling. Thanks, and I really appreciate the educating and entertaining podcast. (laughs) And one more thing. How come your charming and lovely assistant has a beautiful southern accent and you guys sound like any old guys from anywhere? I understand that there's no nexus between your show and the FAA and NACA, et cetera, but is there any way you could arrange for a nexus between me and your lovely assistant? Unless, of course, she happens to be one of your wives, in which case, never mind. <laughs> Cheers. Mike Lima, that, that is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I will not be arranging a nexus, but good on you for asking. Uh, <laughs> yes. The chat room can see me. That's... I'm having a hard time not laughing at that. So. <laughs> uh, well, she has a southern accent, I would guess, because she's from the south. Mm-hmm. You, and we're two old guys are, from anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the northwest. I am from uh, accentless northwest. Mm. Well, here we go. The <laughs> accentless area of the country where <laughs> you are the you're the normal one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, let's go back to his question. See how well you distracted me on that one. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so opposite direction is a big deal. We can't do that. Um, I don't understand. If he's in the pattern, I get it. I know it seems benign, and hey, you're on a different surface, and you're that you know you're not going to get near that other person. But I'm telling you, I'd say this as nicely and politically correct as possible. If there was a way to make a big deal about everything, this is it. If you put those airplanes on opposite finals, opposing finals, you will hear about it. Some alarm goes off yes. in QA, QC land, and they will tear that facility apart. That yes. controller will be regretful that they ever did that. That yes. will cause a lot of problems. Please don't do that. 
any controllers listening, if you think you won't get caught because the VFR and their VFR airplanes, you will get caught and they will come asking questions. Don't do that. Yes. Due to some events <laughs> that happened Plural. a couple of years ago, <laughs> opposite direction became a huge deal. Massive. And there are the requirements for us to do it, even with runways that are a mile apart, mm-hmm. are, I'm not going to say insurmountable, but they are a huge pain intentionally. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's lots a, of approvals, lots of requests. Coordinating super, on, the, yeah. on the landline. The supervisor has to be mm-hmm. on the landline coordinating this thing and... Yeah, there's cutoff points. That first airplane can't be closer than X. And now each local has their own way of adapting to this because some facilities, they can't move airplanes without some sort of opposite direction. That's just not how it works. So Yeah, right. uh, We have big, giant runways and no real terrain problems. So it's hard to make an argument that we have to do it here. You just have to wait. If we turn an airplane or airport around or we have, you know, a one-off that wants to go opposite direction... You know, they'll ask 40 miles away, and we'll tell them, no, 40 miles away. There's departures coming out. It's never going to happen. We have to stop the airport, all for you to prevent flying for in a jet, you know, maybe an extra 10 miles. It's just not going to happen. So Yeah. We have to be, what, 10? No. 10 flying miles? Yes. 10 flying miles. The the arrival cannot be closer than 10 flying miles from the airport when the departure tags up, right? Correct. So... Yeah, make a giant right ten nautical mile circumference three sixty, mm-hmm. and then and then we're legal. So, yeah, there's just so much stuff that has to you know that you've got to check all these boxes, and if you don't check one of them, you did it wrong, and now you get us you're getting a slap on the wrist, or in this case for opposite direction, probably like a paddle to the behind. It's more yeah, like, it's yeah. Nothing. Look, that situation may have been safe, but that's not how they look at it because. So, I'll say this nicely. Sometimes controllers take a green light to do something benign like that and turn it into, well, why can't we have two IFRs promised to the same surface? That's how quickly it escalates. Right. It doesn't say that I can't. That's usually the argument. Right. <laughs> one of them was still in the air when the other one got off the runway. What's wrong with that? Uh, yeah. What if he went missed? Well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> right. Which is how the book went from four pages to like six four, inches thick. Four inches thick, of, yeah. Of things saying you can't do this because that was always the argument. Oh, it doesn't say I can't. Okay, now it does say you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Thanks a lot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good question. Hopefully we answered it. You want number three? Number three from Romeo Whiskey. AG and RH have now been asked this question by ATC four times. The first was a couple months ago, but then yesterday, three different controllers asked the same question on two different legs of a flight, so I figured I'd ask you. I'm cruising along and would like to start my descent to my destination. I say something like, November 345, would like to begin my descent. And the response from ATC is, (laughs) how low would you like to go? Caught off guard, my response the first time was, well, all the way to the ground eventually, which... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> did, did get a laugh from ATC. The first time this happened made me raise an eyebrow, but okay, maybe just some training or communication issue or whatever. But then, like I said, it happened three times yesterday with both center and approach facilities. Each time I was flying a pressurized piston twin in the high teens or low flight levels. Uh, my speed is decent, over 200 knots. So at those altitudes, I do want to start down a pretty good distance from my destination up to 100 miles away. Yeah, I get that. My hypothesis is that this is an altitude range that ATC doesn't see that much. You are 100% correct. You are in no man's land. You are, you're in pressurized land, but you're way below jet land. So this is where we live in the King Air in this weird no man's land area. <clears throat> most smaller piston aircraft at lower altitudes don't really need to start down until much closer to their destination. Uh, that is also correct. And I wish that you could tell about half the arrivals to triad the same thing. And most larger aircraft uh, like jets are handled 
thousands of times a day, and ATC is very used to dealing with them. You would think that that, you would think that, yes. <laughs> Am I just in a weird middle ground here, or is there some other reason ATC would be asking this question? Is there some better way I could word my request to descend to make it clear? Thanks, Romeo Whiskey. Mm. Mm. Uh, is there a better way? You are in a middle ground. Um, it isn't something they're used to doing in terms of, hey, you know, like you said, when the, when there's jets inbound and they, they're flying a very predictable pattern, I pretty much know when they need to start down. Right. And you can tell sometimes the guys that you clear for the visual way out, if they're willing to say 40 miles out that they have the airfield and you clear them and they haven't started down, <laughs> you know as the controller, like, yeah, man, <laughs> should have started down like... 10 miles ago, but hey, I'm not trying to fly your airplane, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you do you. Um, yeah, so it's some of that. Is there a better way to make it clear? It, I don't know. I don't know. It just depends. I guess you would want to know maybe the approach altitude. Maybe if there was an approach, pick the altitude that the approach starts at. I'm guessing that they're asking that because... They have the altitude to give away. If they're if they're the ones working you into that airport and they own it down to the ground, and there's no conflict, mm -hmm. well, okay, like you know, you want to go all the way. I mean, ask for a discretion to three thousand feet above the ground. I don't know whatever that you know works out to be something in that neighborhood maybe just to get started but ask for a discretion descent um okay so i have something to add to this and so okay. of all the new bells and whistles with gps and i just downloaded a simulator on my ipad to play with the gps that's in the skyhawk if there's any tool you have it's the top of descent in this case mm -hmm. if you if you see a top of descent because you put in let's say you loaded an approach Hey, I think I'm going to get the visual, whatever. I'll put the GPS for this side of the airport. I've already heard the ATIS. You can start doing some planning. Tell them if you start down now, you don't have to ask for 3,000 feet. In that most examples, that's going to be close to an approach altitude. You don't have to ask for all the way down. But if you're in the teens, you know, from a jet planning perspective, if we went inside of 30 miles, 10,000 feet or higher, if we're inside of 30 miles, we're starting to think we got to get down. That's about a three degree glide path to the ground and your top of descent. You can set that up on your GPS to be the same three degrees and that'll give you a visual warning in your airplane. It's time to start down. Oh, what do you want? Well, I'm at 19. How about 10? 10 a good round number. I'm going to try to be at 10 by the time I get within 30 miles of the airport. I cannot think of a single airport in the United States where that wouldn't place you very close to a boundary with a Tracon that's going to know when to start you down after that. The centers, you're in kind of weird zone where maybe 20 years ago there were more king airs flying around and turboprops but now you're kind of an anomaly and their letters with the adjacent sectors say you've got to cross at a certain time well they're not thinking of you because you're not going you're not moving across the earth maybe they're not an arrival you're not going as fast as what they're normally used to seeing so don't be afraid to ask for it i would say 10 is going to get you in a tracons zone 10 or 11 depending on what direction you're going that'll get you in the right ballpark but use your use the tools you have a little bit of descent planning ahead of time will make that question easier to answer with the approach controller. Yeah, that's true. And you could also set up fixes in your flight plan. Hey, at, you know, I pick a point that's 30 miles from your airport. I want to cross this at 10, at that, excuse me, at 10,000 feet. Again, at 10,000, you're probably going to be inside of Tricon's airspace or very close and they will know what to do with you. You won't be talking to a center controller. It's like, what do I do with this King Arrows? at <laughs> 22,000 feet. It's such a weird altitude. Just leave him high. Just leave him. He'll <laughs> just leave him there until yeah. he complains and then ask him yeah. what he wants. Put it on him. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my entire life in the in route structure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, we got to really hit on some center controllers on this one. Nice. As is proper. I get number four. Thank you, Romeo Whiskey. I win number four. Yes. From Juliet Mike. Hey guys, I passed my instrument check ride last Thursday. Congratulations. Very nice. Oops. 
Thank you for the like on my Instagram post. I fly in Bedford under the class Boston Bravo since I have full-time job. See, was that good? Was I insulting to somebody? Am I going to be murdered in my sleep? <laughs> I don't care what you say. You're always insulting somebody, but <laughs> sounded good to me. Uh, so I have a full-time job and I fly as a hobby. I started training in January. It's a terrible time to start training up there. Mm. But I feel like this took forever to complete. It was a rough rating to get. It is a rough rating to get, and that's why it took forever, probably because of weather. Happy to be done, but I'm aware the other the learning never ends, and I look forward to continue growing and learning what this IFR world has to offer. I discovered your podcast from one of my two CF double eyes I had during my training. I've been going backwards, and I'm now on episode 94, so still a long way to go. Your advice has been invaluable. For my training, love the show, keep up the great work. I have a huge amount of respect for ATC controllers. Thank you. During my training, I was shooting approach after approach at three different airports under a busy Bravo, and you guys were always happy to accommodate me and help me, especially on those nice VFR days where everyone is flying. Thanks, Julie Mike. They do a good job up there. Thanks for the shout out for Boston Approach. Nice. And congrats on your instrument rating. Now it's summertime, and you could actually probably fly in some of those clouds in that area and not worry about icing as much. Mm. That's always nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, look, you get audio. Oh, how nice. <laughs> Number five from Foxtrot Alpha Mike. All right, here's the audio. Hello, RH and AG. I am a CFII from the southern end of the state connected with Buckeyes, although originally from the U. You don't like K's. One of my instrument students told me about your show. I have to say I am now hooked. I listen to your current shows as they come out, but I also listen to the old ones. I am now up to OB97. It's very confusing at times, jumping backwards and forwards between the shows. It's a little like time travel, and I can't remember what is happening in which time period. Back in the first time zone, October 2019, you were bidding for time off in 2020. My immediate thought was, oh, poor souls. They have no idea what is coming. I'm sure your 2020 was as frustrating as everyone else's. I heard about people generously being, bringing pizza to you during the government shutdown. I was wondering if anybody bought toilet paper for you during the big run on TP. <laughs> I have to say, I love your dry sense of humor. In the previous time zone, I love the giggles as you do the trumpet fanfare and RG says the patron's name. I miss that in the current time zone, but life must move on. I do have a question for you. In OB178, wow, you've come a long way and I have a lot more to listen to. Uh, you talked about a pilot who was cleared as filed and then had to copy a new clearance in the air. The pilot was given a much longer route than the one filed. My questions are, one, why was he ever cleared as filed when he obviously was not going to get that route? And two, when we file, we have to report fuel on board. Does ATC know that number? Do they take that into consideration when they reroute someone? Or is that number just for search and rescue? As a flight instructor, I have frequently told my students about ATC.net to help with communications with ATC. I'm now going to be telling them about your podcast. I think it is invaluable. It has changed the way I teach. Thank you so much for a great podcast. Oh, and by the way, back in your former lives, 2019, you occasionally mention the upcoming episode 100, which you are not yet prepared for. Hmm, how would it work if we pilots keyed up the mic and were not prepared when we talk to ATC? Could get messy. Anyway, thanks again. Foxtrot Alpha Mike. Cool, thank you. Very nice. Uh, yes, it, it could get messy. In fact, it does <laughs> every day. <laughs> we have episode 200 coming up. 200. And we have, and we have no special plans yet. No. No. <laughs> oh, she had two good questions in there. Why do we get cleared as filed? And then if they're never going to get it. Ah, oh, man, I don't know. Someone kicking the can down the road. 
Mm-hmm. The letter of agreement says I can clear you as filed. After that, I don't really care. It's not my problem. <laughs> that <laughs> That is probably... I, I don't know. I, that's prob- if, Maybe that's unfair to say, but I think that's probably what's happening. If you have to go across, or, or we've said this before, around or near or even what you think is close to a Bravo and you got cleared as filed from an airport that's 500 miles away, which is not unreasonable for GA. The odds of you getting as filed, unless you filed around all of those areas are slim to none. So, Oh yeah. I mean, if it's that far down the road, absolutely. I mean, even if it's 300 I, miles, half that. Oh, you know. even if it's, <clears throat> even if it's a hundred, I mean, uh, getting out of an airspace is one thing. After that, once you're in the next facility's airspace, I have no idea what their None. letters are with the next facility, let alone <laughs> six facilities down the line. I, I mean, mm-hmm. there's no way for us to know. That is going to happen all the time. Mm-hmm. I thought we were talking about like same facility, Oh no! I like at Triad, about- I clear you as filed. Then you get with departure, and they say I have a reroute. Now that might happen if the clearance delivery guy made a mistake, <laughs> which happens. Yeah, when, that might happen when the clearance delivery guy makes a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the exception. I mean, but if you're as filed, you go with departure. They hand you off to the next sector, or maybe to the center. And then that facility gives you a reroute. There's nothing the clearance delivery guy can do about it. Yeah, we never hear about that. We don't. We don't have any data on that either. So we get around Metroplex all the time. That's half our job on South Radar, is going around that airspace. Right. I don't know what happens when you get into the next sector. You might get another fix that I don't know anything about. I yeah. have no idea. You're yeah. gone. Then my letter says I got to put you here. Bye bye. Right. Yeah, the only time that routes tend to get coordinated over their entire length is jets going into busy places, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, where a huge percentage of the traffic that 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 those sectors are working is, you know, are fast moving jets going into to big class Bravos. And, um, you know, there's someone there's a there's a big clearing house the traffic management people are looking at big picture stuff and they're handing down reroutes to us you know way down line yeah way ahead of way yeah. ahead our follow up question was about fuel hmm no we have no idea about that that's None. probably the easiest way to answer that i would have to dig and dig and dig and call flight service or somebody to try to look you know at your the way you filed to see, but then there's no way that if I'm going to do a reroute that I'm going to sit there and calculate how far mm-hmm. out of your way it was, how much extra fuel is that going to take? I have no idea. Mm-mm. No, it's on you. But that does, it's a good reminder for uh, aircraft that are going and stretching their fuel and maybe don't have sophisticated fuel management on board electronically to keep up with that. You're going to have to have a good idea when you took off and, you know, if you're stretching the length of distance for your plane in the range, be careful because reroutes could ruin that whole plan. Wind does that all the time, but reroutes can really put a damper on your plan. So Yeah, don't file direct, think you're gonna get it and plan, you know, for that direct flight to carry you right up to reserve or something. That is not right. not a good plan. Especially on this side of the country. All right, we have one more good question out. Fox Trade Alpha Mike, thank you for sending that awesome audio in. And I'll get the last one. All right. From Petra and Papa Tango, who is in the chat room. Timely feedback in a robotic voice. Question, when you lose radar contact, does the target or tag on your screen simply disappear? I'm thinking that there must be something left behind on the screens to indicate this. Maybe the target blinks or turns a different color. If not, and you have a very busy screen with, say, 25 airplanes... How would you notice if one dropped off? You guys are always bragging about your crack short-term memory. Maybe you do <laughs> notice if one drops off and in a crowded sky and can can recall its tail number. Second, uh, let's answer that question first. I don't think we talked about this 
well, there's one tool we have available to us besides the strip being in front of us and counting airplanes. So if we have 10 airplanes, we should have 10 pieces of paper in front of us. That's, it seems archaic, but that's a good way to keep up with your planes. Yes. <laughs> and it's required in the book. If you don't have strips, you're supposed to have some other electronic means to track those planes. Right. Um, when they do drop off, we do have a drop and a co-suspend list on our screen. Now, I get made fun of for this. Mine is in the middle of my scope. If somebody drops off, I am forced to look at it. I can't ignore it. It's not hidden in some corner of my screen. It's right there. And it should trigger me saying, huh, why is there something here? It'll make me mad because it's in my way, but it's in no man's land on the screen. It's it's up by Mount Airy where you can't, nobody cares. There's hardly any airplanes up there, but I can still see it. It's in my line of sight. Okay. It's in the airspace? It, yeah, it's in the airspace. Oh, oh yeah. I can't do that. No. <laughs> No, 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 no. (laughs) Well, why not? It's in a place where I can see it when I need to. Like, it's a reminder. One of your airplane's targets just dropped off. That doesn't happen that often anymore, by the way. That used to happen a lot more. We were, AG and I were brought up on an archaic, old school, 60s radar technology that radar tags dropped off all the time. There is no blinking. It's just, poof, it's gone. There's no burn in the screen. It is gone. And if you weren't counting... And keeping up with strips, I don't know why you would remember. You, you have to have some mechanism to keep up with it. That co-suspend list is still there. So you should be figuring out, like, wait a second, I'm missing an airplane. Yeah. You have anything? Well, sometimes, you know, depending on the reason that it dropped off, it, it will go into coast, and it will leave a data tag there, mm. and it will say coast, CST, down in the data block, where mm-hmm. it used to say altitude. And... And then it's depending on, you know, if it actually lost the primary or it's lost the secondary or what it has, it might try to predict the track for a little bit where the track will just sort of keep plugging along doing mm-hmm. what it was doing, but it's not reliable. Um, and you might not catch that. You might not catch it dropping off the scope completely unless you keep your co suspend list in the airspace. Which is, hmm. just seems really aggravating to me. But it is aggravating. <laughs> it is on purpose. I, I get it. <laughs> uh, but that scenario where a tag drops off when you're really busy is like a controller's mm. nightmare. Mm-hmm. And that plane that... just keeps flying and flying, <laughs> flying, oh. and it goes into yeah. the next airspace, and it's mm-hmm. two airspaces away. That has happened. Yes. Not to me. I've been around when it's happened. It's yeah. terrifying. It is terrifying because you don't know how many airplanes got close to it, how many deals you had. You have no idea. Yeah. You had <laughs> at least one when it flew into the next sector. <laughs> yeah, without a handoff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, that is... That can happen. It's just not very... It's not very common. That's right. not very common. All right. Last question he had was, uh, you guys talk about Bravo and Charlie airspace for us non-pilots. Is there a such thing as class alpha? There is in general, and I'm not going to get too much in the weeds on this in general, it's above 18,000 feet in the United States, uh, as class alpha airspace and, and VFRs can't go up there. It's for IFR only. So, and just a little, uh, a little extra knowledge on class A. It has the same altimeter setting everywhere. Mm. So when you go above 18, you set the altimeter to 2992. And they stop saying the altimeter every time you check in. The center just says, Roger. Yeah, they just, when you say check in, they say yeah. Roger. Roger. Like, you're not even going to give me an altimeter setting? Yeah, nothing. 2992. You can always <laughs> tell when a, when a Tracon controller transfers to a center. On their first check in, they give... Altimeter two nine or nine or two, and the whole frequency just laughs and points at him. <laughs> you dummy! <laughs> All, right, All right, that's it. I know we went long today. We do not have a new question of the week. I did not write a new commercial for PilotSacks.com or ATCSacks.com. <laughs> go check it out. Ag, anything to add before we go to the chat room? Negative. All right, we have feedback prior to April 27th, right on the show, or responded via email. If you think I didn't get an email, go check spam because I respond from the feedback email address, or AG does, and that 
trigger some robotic spam detection. I don't know. I don't have anything else. Okay. Closing out episode 180 of Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk, Romeo Hotel. And Alpha Golf. Goodbye, everyone. Visit opposingbases.com where you can leave Romeo Hotel and Alpha Golf an audio or written message. Find them on Twitter and Instagram at Opposing Bases. Or send feedback directly to their inbox at feedback at opposingbases.com. The views and opinions expressed on Opposing Bases Air Traffic Talk are for entertainment purposes only and do not represent the views, opinions, or official positions of the Federal Aviation Administration, Department of Transportation, or the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. All show recordings are done on personal time and personal property. Actual air traffic recordings are from third-party sources, and no government resources are used in the production of the show. There is no nexus between opposing bases and the FAA or NACA. All episodes are the property of opposing bases and shall not be recorded or transcribed without express written consent. For official guidance on laws, rules, and regulations, refer to your local flight standards district office or a certified flight instructor. Opposing Bases offers this podcast to promote aviation safety and enhance the knowledge of its listeners, but makes no guarantees to listeners regarding accuracy or legal applications.